The Mets pursue their skipper as the lockout lingers, and the Hall of Fame gets a new half dozen. Diamond Diehards is on! Joe Rizzo here bringing you baseball along with the dog, Jeff Healy. We are bringing it to you straight up on a Wednesday early evening, a little bit earlier than usual. So uh, if you are cruising around on Facebook and you pop this on, we're glad to have you. You get the bonus of catching this thing live. And if you are looking at it on your own time on Facebook or YouTube, or you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or anywhere else, we'd like you to hit those follow or subscribe buttons, the alert buttons, the like buttons, write us a, a review, give us five stars, whatever it is, if, if you like what we're doing, uh, please continue it. You could follow us on Twitter at Diamond Diehards for me. I run the regular Diamond Diehards one, and you could check out the dog at Jeff Healy 8. That's the number eight. And don't forget to check out our Facebook group, Facebook page, LinkedIn, if you want to do some business with us, like Big Ed's Car Wash in Fairlawn, New Jersey, fmsgraphics.com and sportsmaps.com. You could join us that way or just contact us anywhere on social media where we are at Diamond Diehards, including TikTok and maybe a new TikTok coming up for the holidays. Uh, we've been good with the few that we've done. So we are going to talk about the Mets' uh, pursuit of their new skipper. We are going to give you a little rundown of what we see uh, as relevant for the average fan here listening to us about the lockout. What does it mean to, uh, to you? What does it mean to the players? And we'll talk about the six new members of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum that were just elected by the ERAs committees, the, uh, the early days era and the golden days era there's you know the pre i don't know i i maybe i got the the committee's wrong but anyway six new ones in two still living we'll get to all of it very shortly but first we bring in the dog for veteran of the day jeff healy welcome thank you riz uh yeah we're gonna kick this one back uh a little day uh, day after here, but uh, obviously a day of infamy yesterday, uh, December 7th, 1941. Uh, so for this, we're going to go back and honor someone who is a hero on that day. Uh, so this is our veteran of the day is going to be Navy uh, Cook 3rd Class, Doris Miller. So Doris Miller um, was the first black American to be awarded the Navy Cross, the highest uh, decoration for valor uh, in combat, uh, just below the Medal of Honor. <clears throat> so Miller was serving on the battleship West Virginia, uh, sitting at in Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor uh, when he was attacked on December 7th. So he came up, uh, he went to his battle station. It had already been blown up. So he went back and said, help, let me find somewhere else I can help. He went up to the bridge, helped uh, evacuate the captain who was injured. Uh, the XO said, here's a 50 caliber machine gun, figure out how to shoot it. <laughs> he literally didn't, didn't know how to use, didn't know how to use it. He figured he helped him feed it. Uh, he went up getting on it. It was a pretty, pretty good one at it. And uh, shot down two Japanese aircraft using the, using their, uh, 50 caliber up there, which is uh, pretty remarkable. Um, not, not a lot of guys shot down anything on uh, December 7th and uh, for him to jump in the first time ever shooting that thing, uh, knocking down two was amazing. Um, wound up, uh surviving throughout the battle and then eventually uh, died later on in a torpedo attack uh, later on in the war. But uh, again, Doris Miller, uh, our veteran day, U.S. Navy cook, third class. Um, he had a, a frigate named after him, uh, 1973, and he's scheduled to have the fourth Joe Ford nuclear-powered aircraft carrier uh, to be named after him. So about $13 billion Bucks worth of a U.S. sovereign territory floating around out there. Uh, a pretty uh, pretty high honor that uh, they'll be able to look at for the next 50 or 60 years. So, again, uh, Doris Miller, our veteran of the day. Very good. And always apropos, as, uh, as we talk about a day that will live in infamy, December 7th, and we do this show on December 8th, so that's our first show since uh, Pearl Harbor Day. And always a good time to be reminded of what the past generations did for us here in uh, in America, and in and in this case for the for the world, to uh, 
to get us to where we are, where we have the privilege to do stuff like a like a silly little baseball podcast, right, dog? It's uh, it's 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 a, it's a privileged life that we lead, and you know, we're we're glad to do it. And speaking of privileged lives, there's a baseball lockout. <laughs> because after 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 players and owners decide that you know two billion dollars or such worth of uh, free agent contracts were you know an indication of just how broken the system is, uh, the collective bargaining agreement expired a week ago, uh, as of the time we are doing this, and you know there's labor issues, uh, a salary floor or cap. Uh, free agency age versus service time, revenue sharing, and then you got the uh, the byproduct of it, where like MLB.com clears clears all the current player images and news. Um, so we're 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 stuck in this muck here, dog. We're stuck in this muck, and and you know my sense is that let the bottom line to me is are we going to miss games or not? And it's hard to say that on December eighth, but I feel like. Even if they're not negotiating very well or publicly, um, I, I just don't feel like this is one of those where we can't turn the Titanic in time. Like, I, I think they get it done. I, I, it's just my gut feeling. It's kind of been my gut feeling all along. And of course, like, I'm one of these guys who always wants to see the positive light of it. But, you know, if I felt the other way, I mean, I, I, I would express that. I just feel like there's a better chance that they get this done because how could you look at the system the way it is? You have a different world series winner every year. You have sometimes small market teams like the Rays who are in contention, you know, with, with a fair amount of frequency, you have players getting paid out the wazoo and uh, you know, there's there, could there be more parity? Yeah. But like sometimes that makes the NFL and, and, uh, these other sports a, a little stale. So my my gut dog is that they get it done somehow. Yeah, it's uh it's interesting. It's, it, when you, if you look at it, you know most of the time there's sort of like a big structural issue, right? So like when you have the salary cap first go in, you know m- major changes to free agency. You know you, you can kind of see like where it's it's tough to compromise. Um, like you just laid out, there, there's not a lot of really big we have to have this or there's just no way it's really kind of negotiating around sort of the existing structures within it. Um, which generally always feels like that's something you, you should be able to kind of do. Like you can trade off a little on this, trade off a little on that. There's no like all or none situations going on there. Um, I think the wrinkle in this is um, there's just so much animosity, I think between the player association and the, uh, and the owners, uh, you know, I think Manfred has just kind of done nothing but just worked the crap out of everybody all around. Uh, the players feel like they kind of got ripped off the last couple of times. So they got a, a new negotiator in who's um, um, going to be a much a much tougher negotiator. So like everyone, everyone's kind of got, there's not a ton to disagree about, but everyone's like all hepped up to disagree and prove themselves to, to their constituents, uh, which makes it sort of like... The, a feeling that maybe this drags on longer than it really should. If you were, were sitting here from the outside and said, let's just throw us all together and we're going to arbitrate this over the weekend, go. It feels like you should be able to do that, but uh, it feels like it's going to kind of drag out because I think each side wants to prove it to to themselves and to the other side that they're willing to fight. They're always willing to fight. It's just a matter of who then is going to back down in the end, or if they don't even have to make them back down in the end, if they could just be amicable about it, uh, amicable about it. And, you know, that, that is not going to happen at the beginning, obviously. Right. Because they want to, you know, that like, let's use the baseball term, right? Like they want to dig into the box and say, look, I'm here. And, you know, if the pitch is coming up under the chin, uh, you know, they're digging right back into the box. <laughs> like yeah. that's what it's, that's what it's going to be like here for, for a little bit, but I think they have it too good. And they, you know, from a player standpoint and an owner standpoint, dog, I feel like the COVID thing just, they missed out. I, you know, it's hard to say they lost money, right? <laughs> when you're making so much, but they lost out on 
a whole lot of money on both sides from player and and owner perspectives respectively and you know you don't want that to linger on like that's just not good business and i know sometimes that these sides and their negotiations have not always fallen on the sides of that's good business but you know baseball's in a pretty good spot right now and there's a lot of there's a lot of good feeling and there's a lot of uh you know happiness around the league of course like no not not every fan base and not every uh team not every set of players is going to always be happy you're just never going to make everybody happy but as as an umbrella there's a few things that you could fix um in terms of like the 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 labor stuff but but for the most part like the the proof is really in the dollars that the terms of the last cba worked pretty darn good like they don't need to be redone tremendously but it's it's smart to review it every few years and if there are a couple of things in there that you really want to hold out on hold out see if you could get a change see if you could get it improved and uh you know but don't cut off your nose to spite your face here yeah it's it's uh it's interesting and too like you have um maybe another argument that sort of extends it out is yeah you almost have disagreements among each side, right? You have like the big market teams, small market teams, right? So right now you, you know, you want, I think the fan wants to see more of a balance. Like you said, it, it doesn't have pure parity, but you want to be able to have like, if you don't have a super organization like the Rays, like, you know what, let the pirates be competitive or make the pirates be competitive. You know, like when they develop these players, make them hold on to those kind of players, right? And give their fan, give their fan base a little bit of hope. They're like, you know what, we get, we get lightning in the bottle. We catch a couple of guys pre free agency. You know, we can make a real run at it. Um, you know, and then you have on the player side, you know, I mean, it's interesting. The negotiating side, you know, it's over 50% Boris clients are on it. There's all sorts of conspiracy theory on that or whatnot. But you sort of have the, the super pay. Like right now, you're getting the super pay days, right? You're getting the 40 million plus sort of guys, whatever. And then what happens to the guys in that sort of that two to five year like pre free agency time and how much do they sort of get fought for? Like it, it sort of feels like, you know, from a fan perspective, you know, you know, like my guys, like, you know, a Nimmo and Alonzo, whatever, right? Yeah. It feels like they should probably, if you, if you do well, that pre, that pre arbitration, I mean, the owners are kind of hinting that anyway, right. By trying to rip up their free agency and, and start to extend them later, or I'm sorry, earlier, uh, pre free agency. That you know, like those guys should start to get more of the benefits quicker, yeah. In my view, now I don't know if that means pre free agency or just you know increasing the salaries, or whatever for for the pre free agency guys. But there's some room to go on there. But the player association, are they going to do that, right? Or they're just going to say, you know what, you guys got to prove your time when you get your six years and you get your forty million bucks like this guy, you'll be all set. Um, you know, some some guys want to get getting burned by that. Right. And yeah, you know, they get, talk- getting hurt early. Right. I mean, you know, again, like, a, you know, a Harvey is sort of an example like that. Right. Where he's going to pre free agency or whatever and, and really put himself at risk and basically torpedo his career. Um, you know, there should be ways to to kind of balance that just from a fan perspective, like the players should share a little more equally. And it feels like the owner should share a little more equally. And that's going to be better for the sport overall. Well, I think that we got to see, dog, if they're going to focus from a union perspective on which tier of player they're trying to help out the most? Like, is it the superstar player? Probably not as much, right? Is it that, that, that middle level player in terms of, you know, not the, not the Mike Trout level from a veteran perspective and, and not even like the Wander Franco perspective from, uh, from a young player, but those, guys that are populating the balance of your roster where you're trying to get them from this salary level up to here, even if it's just a small tick and it goes all the way through, you know, there's probably a few things like you were just talking about that they could do that would really benefit that class of player. And that's going to account for the, the vast majority of players that are, that are in the league taking up spots on let's say 25 man rosters or you know whatever they become 26 man as opposed to the 40 man rosters um so that also adjusts how 
the owners and management would deal with younger players going forward if they if they really focus here on getting those veteran guys a little bit more and you know a few extra years a few extra dollars then we're going to stop probably seeing some of these young guys get 223 million dollar contracts when they're six years you know five years away from free agency like buying out of you know four or five years of of free agency to give the guaranteed money and then assume the grand part of that risk. So I, I think it's, you know, if they focus on those mid guys, they'll probably get some traction there. Um, and if they focus on the young guys, I, I sense maybe it's going to be a little tougher road to hoe. Um, and I think from a union uh, view dog, I, you know, if I'm, if I'm in the players union, I'm definitely like pushing for the, you know, the, the Jeff McNeil types, you know, like those those guys that are that are all over rosters, you know, to 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 do a little bit better. Even the, I mean, not that they don't do great to begin with, but like from a perspective of where they are now and where they could be in the next collective bargaining agreement, like those are the guys that I think that they probably want to focus on, and that's a good way to get a deal done, actually. Yeah, and it it's to kind of go uh, to add to that. You know, when we talked about like the salary cap and, you know, they're talking about, I guess the only structural thing that we've sort of muttering around is, you know, potentially a salary floor. Uh, there might be a way to sort of take care of that too. Is that, you know, you, you start to make it where if you hold guys in the fourth, fifth, sixth year, uh, they're going to wind up making more and you're going to naturally start to take care of that situation where you're going to need to to spend more on your major league team because you're frankly just not going to have anybody else around to, to kind of uh, kind of hold on to that. Yeah, you know, so maybe it's maybe it's like you don't cut the free agency time down, but you you make it more rewarding for years four, five, six, right? And if I'm a small market team, I can still sort of say like, all right, like once my great guy gets to year six, I'm toast. Like I'm I can't compete against like the the top ten um, for my guy, but I still have the path to like I can be a competitive team, even if I have to pay in year five and year six a little bit more, but I'm not paying the twenty million that I just, I simply can't do with my roster. So the thing about the salary floor, like you can't, it, it's useless without a salary cap, right? Like, yeah, it would have to be in conjunction, yeah. <laughs> and and so to me that, like that's always been a non-starter in baseball. And I don't think the owners even necessarily want it. But like, let's just say, here's the reason why it just blows up, right? before you could even do anything with it. Salary floor without salary cap. Say you want everybody to have a salary floor of at least $100 million a season and in payroll. Well, the Orioles, Pirates, Rays are going to say, okay, so I have to move up from the 40, 50, 60 million that I'm spending. I now have to spend practically, you know, more than double or almost double. And you're telling me now, because there's no salary cap that the Dodgers could just go spend like 500 million on salary or the Mets or whoever, like now the gap could grow even further between those teams. So why should they have to go and, and spend that money when they know that, you know, basically it's going to be a slaughter except for the, for the Rays. like the Rays are saying, well, you know, we could, we could, contend for the title at 60 million. Why do we have to spend a hundred million? Well, now all of a sudden, if you put a cap in there, I guess they talked about 180 million, that would be too low, but let's just say it was 200 million just to make the argument easier. Well, now you have teams that can spend twice as much, but do they need to, or how close are they going to get? Um, but if the salary floor comes up now, you've definitely taken care of all those guys in the middle, right? You're yep. bringing up the Jorge Soler's, you know, they're getting a little bit more, they become a little bit more valuable because teams now are going to say, well, instead of playing my rookie out there for 80 games and you know, when he's not cutting it, I bring another rookie to play 80 games. Um, or if, you know, first, second year guy, whatever it is, I'm going to sign one of these veterans. I got to spend the money anyway. So I'm going to spend $11 million this year on Jorge Soler and see what he gets me. And then if he's good and we want to keep him, okay, we'll, we will sign him for a longer term. 
like now all of a, all of a sudden those guys become a little bit more valuable right now the guys in that class that are getting those type of deals are all pitchers right dog they're all pitchers they're Corey kluber that's who that's who they are they're not you know i mean solaire coming off the the you know clutch postseason performances maybe he'll be a bad example and and get some money but um you know, like a guy like Michael Conforto is just sitting there through the lockout, twiddling his thumbs, wondering where he's going to land and for how much, you know, when this thing all shakes down. Like he wasn't one of the guys that was in the front of the line because he was coming off a, a horrible year. If he had hit free agency after last year, it would have been a totally different story. But this year, you know, there's there's questions and he's just not going to get the type of money that he would get without a salary floor with a salary floor. One of those teams, like for sure, one of those other teams would jump in and say, you know what, we need a right fielder or a left fielder or a center fielder or a DH or whatever. And he's a guy that is a veteran guy. We'll pay him 10 something million. And, you know, maybe, maybe he booms for us. It's not going to yeah. happen without the floor. Yeah. Or, uh, or, you know, you start to incent those. I mean, the other nice thing you'd, you'd like to see is, you know, do you incent those smaller market teams for, uh, to go out and sign those guys in year three, year four to those six year deals, right? And I'll say, yeah, like if you're forcing him into it anyway with the salary floor, like to me, if, if, if I'm them, rather than just like spend it and let these guys walk, I mean, I want to, I want to start to do the, the rip it up and do the, I get the six years in the middle and spend more than I normally would in years one, two, three, and I get to hold them for years. Well, let's say years four, five, six of their, of their service and years seven, eight, nine of their service. I get them a little bit below market, right? So you, you get a little bit more consistency across it. I mean, that's, that's what you'd like to see happen. The question is, would it happen or do, you know, they just let those guys go. And we don't know. I would say going back just just if I could real quick on um, I do think it is vital for baseball to not screw around and not miss games. So to me that you cannot you cannot miss opening day if you're baseball, in my opinion. You know, you've you've had enough bad blood, you've had enough bad history with it. You kind of powered your way through COVID, you're coming through in an okay sort of fashion at this point, uh, to go and risk rehashing the 90s again is uh, a bad situation for them. I could see, you know, maybe you don't get all of spring training or something like that, and you can make a little bit of a point along the way. But both sides, when they're sitting there second week in March, to me, you, I, for the good of the game on both sides, they need to get, get, get their ass in gear. And they, can, they cannot risk getting into, into that sort of mix or they're just going to lose more and more. Right. I mean, that, that's the thing to miss in the big picture, right? They're real, they're real and their, their enemies are each other right now, but their real enemy is, um, you know, MLS and premier league and, you know, e-gaming and everything else. Right. Everyone else not go into a game and let, that will eventually atrophy. Right? Baseball, baseball TV can only be so much for so long. If you, the whole next generation doesn't even watch it. And they, to me, you can't, you cannot start to risk that again. It's a bit, it's a big risk because you're talking about, you know, the morphing and the changing constantly of, of media and how the games are consumed. And you're talking about it being on, you know, really a local basis first rather than a national basis. And the eventual future you'd have to figure is they have to become stronger with their product nationally, which is buoyant of uh, the success that has um, lifted the NFL, you know, and then to some degree, the NBA and, you know, even the NHL in a, in a different way, um, you know, with the, you, you have Canadian markets that, that, uh, you know, that do that, that, that go throughout Canada. And then you have, you know, a TV deal of, uh, of, of hockey games that came nationally and, you know, baseball has their share of it too. But it's, you know, it's real. There's no salary cap. There's no salary floor like those other sports. So those local revenues are, are much, much, much more vital to the baseball teams um, and, you know, the way they operate daily. 
Speaking of operating daily and, and alienating players uh, from the fans, um, MLB wipes, as soon as the lockout starts, you go to MLB.com. There's not one story about any of like the amazing signings and the trades or whatever that, that, that went down leading up to this point. And you go to click on, uh, you know, he's Marcus Stroman signs with the Cubs and you go click on him and there's no headshot of Marcus Stroman anymore. It's just this blank, you know, generic, um, like the Silhouette, equivalent to, yeah. to, 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 like the equivalent to having an egg is your icon on Twitter, right? Like it's, <laughs> it, and it's just everyone. And a lot of the players on, on Twitter changed their, um, changed their, the uh, picks, yeah. their emoji, their emoji or the profile pic to, to that, you know, but <laughs> Dog, there's a reason for that, right? Yeah, you did, you did some good digging on the on that one. So, uh, why don't you uh, you uh, lay it down on us on the? No, I mean it's basically it's it's not it's not it's not once the the collective bargaining agreement is expired, they they uh, MLB doesn't have the right anymore the rights with the players to display that their their likenesses and their images for profit so it's kind of like you know it, it it looks bad but you know if, if they did it then the players could be like hey you're using our likeness and you're gaining traffic and you're getting revenue on mlb.com based on you know stuff that's all related to our players so you know i i they probably could have gotten away with it but you know it's a it's I don't know if it's a, if it's that much of a dick move. It's definitely like a, a, a yeah. ass move. It's a, it's a it's a weird um perceived loss, I would say, like with the between ownership versus the fans. It's the fans I'm pissed off at the owners over it. Right? And so like I perceived that array right, they're they're minus one for the strike for me because you went and you did this petty thing against the players. But the hilarious thing is that like they, they had to. Really, so it's really the the players' rights are the ones dictating that 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 happened, but the owners uh, are going to wind up getting the blame for it from the from the fans. So, uh, shrewd, a shrewd PR move not to say anything about it from uh, MLBPA that they didn't start squawking, so you can't show it, and uh, the lawyers and in, in, uh, at MLB ownership uh, they won the day, but uh, you know maybe maybe they lost that battle. So there is, we, we should say this, and you and I are both big fans of theathletic.com. We're, uh, you know, subscribers there. For If you listen to the show, you know that we talk about it a lot. Um, and it's uh, Stephen J. Nesbitt, Mike Vorkanov, and Evan Drellick uh, wrote a story on MLB-owned media. The players now barely exist. What's behind that decision? And in their digging, they talk to, a you know, a bunch of different legal people and look for statements or whatever. And it's not clear at least to them uh, that it actually is required within the collective bargaining agreement. It just seems like a little bit of one upmanship uh, like with a, with a, you know, a legal background kind of saying, yes, well, you know, we just wanted to make sure we weren't in violation of it. So we took it down. Like, yeah, we could cut, cut through all that. And it's, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like yeah. a cover your ass sort of dick move kind of, you know. Yeah. Just not starting it off well. So. Yeah. It's it's a little, you know, it's like uh it's like a little face wash in the in the scrum after the whistle in hockey, you know, you kind of like <laughs> pushing the goalie around, you know, getting somebody out of there. You could just move the guy around, but you stick your glove in his face a little bit. It's kind of, you know, you're not going to get a penalty for it, but like you still get away with it, you know. It's <laughs> probably one of those kind of things, right? So, I don't know, Doug. Is that enough on the lockout, or do we do we talk about like, like we did we get into? No, the... We have no real news, so <laughs> it's, well, there, that's I kind mean, of the tough part, right? Maybe Other maybe than... the news is that they're being kind of tight lipped about it, right? Like that you haven't really. Yeah. That's usually a good sign, by the way. Yeah. That True. that each side is not using their quote unquote PR hacks to get their side out there. And that usually means uh, good things. It means they're negotiating and, you know, in good confidence. They're not, you know, trashing the other sides too much as they're coming out of their meetings, but maybe they're just not meeting too much. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But again, my, 
we're usually right about this stuff. And, you know, I'm feeling like we're not, I'm feeling like we're not missing games, but yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Now, dog, we could, uh, we could talk a little bit here about the hall of fame where the six new inductees, Buck O'Neill, Gil Hodges, Jim Cott, Minnie Minoso, Tony Oliva, and Bud Fowler gain entry into the hall. Uh, only Oliva and Cott, the former Twins teammates, um, are still with us. And the other four uh, were predeceased of their election. So it's um, a celebration uh, well documented from from the Hodges family, right? Yep. Um, and you know, probably uh, almost equally, or not as maybe not for as long, but for more recent vintage. Uh, Buck O'Neill is is a guy that you know we've had a light shined on, uh, you know, uh, the past ten years or so. Even though he's passed now a few years, but um, you know, it's it it. it there hasn't been too much debate about the terms of these players getting in, um, you know, so far after like they, they missed their, you know, original, uh, original windows. And I think dog, the reason is because let's face it, like, how could you not be happy for, for these, these people and their families? Like you, you look like a, you look like a jerk. If you're standing up there saying, well, you know, like they're kind of. What was Gil Hodges OPS? <laughs> well, I mean, it, yeah, like it, there's, but it's not a bad argument. And, and if you're, if you're dyed in the wool, um, basically dog, I think the way it comes down to it for me is this. And, and, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, but you're either a big hall guy or you're a small hall guy. Right. And yeah. Or girl. Yeah. Or girl. I mean, I, I agree. And I, I think that's sort of the, I guess the argument against her is once you start going down this road that it just opens it up more and more and more for the guys who are great players, but not the immortals. Right. So when, once you kind of broke down from the immortals and you started getting the, the guy's a good player, like a really good player, um, you know, a couple time all-star, et cetera, et cetera. Um, once that starts to come in, it's like precedent, and and everyone you continue to find a way to to weaken it up a little bit. Um, you know, it doesn't matter at some point, right? I mean, if you're not making ridiculous about it, if you get a guy who's like a borderline one, like people have already talked about, like you know, if you extend this out, you know, does does the Matting Lees and Hernandezes in the world and stuff get in? Like you know, to me, the necessarily Hall of Famers, but you know what? Am I going to complain about it in? 10 or 15 years if they wind up getting elected in on the veterans committee no right and at some point it's just like the numbers are going to grow over time anyway so it's not like they're all like ruth and garrick and dimaggio and and uh and all those players right i mean you're gonna ha you're gonna naturally have some uh widening of the pod just over time um so you know just it's for once it's a feel-good story like the only downside one i guess was that dick allen didn't make it in he had, it was in 11 of the 16 he needed 12 so i mean just missed uh within that you know we'll see if he gets cleaned up on a on a later ballot kind of coming through there but um you know i think there's i think there's always it's much less contentiousness with the veteran ones like versus like the the guys who just retired right like you know you'll get people like screaming over whether billy wagner should make it in right they'll be they'll be completely flipping out you know, is anyone really flipping out over Olivo making it in? Uh, you know, you got to be this really, point, no, you got to be really geared, you got to be really geared up to, to sit there and say, no, this guy absolutely doesn't deserve it. From, well, the thing, uh, the reason, the reason why is because the people who saw them play are not the ones that are walking around with piss and vinegar anymore. And they're not yeah. doing shows like this. Yeah. There's very few, you know, Jim Cotton, Tony Oliva are like 83. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, unless you're in your sixties, or 70s you know you're you're not remembering them in their primes i mean jim cott was you know he started game seven of the 65 world series against sandy koufax and in a span of three pitches he he was down two nothing and out of the game and that was that um 
we're old guys and they were you know jim cott and, and oliva they're those guys were like you and i remember cott because he he held on for so many years and he was yeah. lefty against lefties for the 82 cardinals you know and 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 snagged the world series there with whitey herzog and you know we remember him just basically just doing the quick pitch no wind up thing as as a you know he was not a hall of famer when we saw him yeah. he was he was at the end he was a, he was a role player and oliva like you know you and i don't don't remember oliva and yeah, we no. yeah. you know you remember rusty Staub, right yeah. like, <laughs> but you don't remember tony oliva so uh it, so there's not really many people that would go and and jump up and and complain about it and certainly the other players are you know it's 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 anecdotal and um you have no real way to 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 argue very much one way or the other so you, you you let those people in what i think it does dog is you know when you bring in like the the hodges right once tony perez got in that to me that was kind of like okay perez and hodges are so close you know perez did have a little bit better numbers uh hodges was you know a defensive wizard on top of it uh, you know, glue guys batted fifth on, you know, big, big, big teams. So once Perez got in, I think that really helped um, the case eventually for Hodges. But even with that, like Hodges was always the guy that, that like, just like he was, he was your demarcation line. Right. Yeah. Then like point. Harold, then Harold Baines gets in. Well, definitely Gil Hodges over Harold Baines. No, I'm not yeah. knocking Harold Baines. But like you and I did see Harold Baines and I think yeah. both of us were floored when he got into the <laughs> Hall of Fame. Floored, yeah. you know. Like, yeah, Harold Baines was a great, you know, dangerous hitter. And if he had never gotten hurt, he would have been, you know, probably a gold glove level outfielder with a with a sick arm. And, you know, that combination certainly would have been uh, you know soundly more hall worthy than than the one of him as primarily a dh which you know just doesn't it, like if you compare him up it's hard to compare him to anyone in the hall of fame and say you know he cuts the muster but um you know now that like the hodges and 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 the baines get in like you know like who are the next guys we revisit mattingly and hernandez like yeah how are those guys not in then? I mean, if that's the case, yeah. Mattingly's offensive uh, profile is, I think the guy that usually is, is similar is Puckett. So, you know, and Puckett got in relatively with, with ease, you know, yeah. both were, both were clutch hitters, both, you know, high average with some power had, you know, big peaks and then, you know, valleys off at, at the end great defensive players. And it, this is, you know, this is great that we have. Okay. So now the chat dog is, is, uh, is great tonight. This is, this is where us jumping on a little bit earlier and throwing uncle Paul a curveball. We, we threw it on a little bit earlier on the live stream to see if we could get a little more interaction on the chat and it's worked. Um, Murph, so, no, Murph. Yeah, Murph. so, uh, uncle Paul saw Tony Oliva play a lot and he remembers him great hitter uh george Morris love says um the floodgates are opening with the hall of fame and uh, that's all right for some others complain to complain the end of the day uh the, all these hall of fames are a business and he knows that business uh quite well and, and uh george Morris names dale murphy and thurman munson also guys that that ought to be revisited like like I still look at Dale Murphy. I'm like, ha, wait, wait, he's not, he's not in the Hall of Fame. Like, yeah. And it's because he the tail off at the end of his career was, you know, was pretty severe and 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 abrupt. But yeah. like, and a small when market watch, team, right? Yeah, but when, and when you when you watched him play, like he sure as hell felt like a Hall of Famer to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On uh, yeah, hundred percent on that. I mean, I think it'd be interesting too, like. You know, you sort of have you sort of have your tiers within the hall anyway, right? So you have like your first ballot guys, 
right? So that that I think is sort of maybe another thing that's kind of morphing into it, right? It's like you know the first ballot guys, the ones you get elected, you know, in your first you know ten years of eligibility, and then you have like your veteran committee guys who wind up kind of coming out. Which again, like maybe that's sort of like like your your inner circle, your small hall is like your first ballot guys, right? So that's the way I they don't distinguish it, but we as fans do, right? They say this is a guy who serves to be a first ballot hall of famer. And you kind of get the the plaque plaque plus, you know. <laughs> That's you sort of, you sort of had that. No, nobody's going to get that, you know, forty years from now, right? But uh, but when we sit there and talk about it, it's um, you know, it's like the immortals are those first first ballot guys, and then the other ones are sort of like acknowledgement of you know what they what they brought to the game. And George says Fred McGriff is a huge omission, and and. You know, he's another guy. Who, I'm like, wait, he's he's not in there. Like, and and you compare him to these other guys that are there, and you know, it does it does make you wonder, like, what, like 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 why are so many of these guys being missed? It's not really that they're being missed. It's that the standard is ever evolving. But the thing is, dog, once you start letting the guys in, it's big hall that wins. The debate yeah. is over. Um, the debate doesn't exist anymore because once you, you know, once you lower what the bar is, then you have to go back and retroactively put in everybody else. And once they put people into the Hall of Fame, they're not taking them out. Yeah, I think isn't OJ still in the NF, uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame? <laughs> oh, wow, where does this come from? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I mean, you know, they don't take people out of the Hall of Fame, so, uh, you know. Um, uh, Kent, uh, Jeff Kent, Todd Helton. Uh, there's big, there's definitely, like, the online push for Helton is uh, is is pretty big. Yeah. And that's, that, and, you know. I mean, it's funny. I'm like, I mean, back in the day, you had it where if the writers didn't like you, right? I mean, that's why they had the veteran committee. Because so you had so much power concentrated in, you know, a bunch of, you know, whatever writers sitting there. And if the, if the guy never gave him a good quote or the guy was always a jerk to him, he didn't get the vote. Right. And, you know, you had too much power and you probably artificially restricted the hall um, for no reason other than these guys want to be a bunch of jerks. Right. So now that's sort of part of it. It's like you, you start to unwind that, but again, to your point, once you start to do that, you're naturally starting to open it up into um, into the big hall. Uh, Uncle Paul says Pete Rose should be in. Um, Uncle Paul's so comment. Might as well anymore. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, that, that, Paul, that ship uh, has clearly sailed. Uh, Uncle Paul's <laughs> comment uh, brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, by the way, how are we not sponsored by DraftKings? Yeah, everyone else is. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think the Diamond Dog sponsored but DraftKings. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, George uh, Morris says Whitaker will get in because he's a friend of Trammell. And as a fan, he sure enjoyed Trammell and Whitaker, but not Hall of Famers in his eyes and, and maybe others. Those, those are two tough ones right there, right? Yeah. Well, I listen. Great case either side. There's, there's either side. I mean, I brought up Mattingly and Hernandez and, and, uh, you know, Dale Murphy's definitely like, I would have him. In there before even yeah. those other guys and some of the other guys that are mentioned here, but yeah, to me right. there's one just very striking omission that now you have like no way, there's no case that you can't put in this guy and that's that's Albert Bell. I mean, yeah. numbers th- are huge. That that the like, phew, come on, like he blows these guys away except for except to me for Dale Murphy, because of you know Murph was the MVPs and, you know, versatility of like the, the great two, defense, the too. two hardest positions, like starts as a catcher, you know, wins MVPs as a center fielder. Um, so, yeah, but Albert Bell, I mean, he has the truncated career, but his tail off was like not much at all. I mean, he was still one of the most productive hitters in baseball and you know injury basically just put an end to it for for him he just couldn't do it anymore um but he was a guy you know who got very little consideration for the hall because you know he 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 didn't uh endear himself to yeah 
to the media. But like you look at his numbers and the numbers case for him is it's absurd. Like you just look, he compares up to all, <laughs> to all Hall of Famers. The guys in his baseball reference similarity scores are all like top level guys. So yeah. like, you know, now what are you going to do? Like you got to. You- no, that's it. That's interesting too. As you start to go along, I mean, we're really starting to run into that for pitchers, right? Like where you had, you had 300 wins was it, right? Like you had three wins. If you won 300, you made it. If you didn't, you didn't. You know, now, like, that's going to be impossible, right? I mean, in 10 years, there's going to be nobody with 300 wins that's even among consideration or, you know, going to approach that to, to get in there, right? So you're going to start to shift to, you know, is it is it war or is it, you know, the, um, the you know, per batter stats, you know, the, the case per nine and the whip and everything else like that. And when you start to do that, like, all the guys who, who, who weren't around long enough to compile – also, like all these guys, I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, this guy like was hitting, you know, 50 dingers a year and he was out after eight years. So he had his 400 and he have his magical 500. But this guy hits more than this other guy who's going in who, uh, you know, on a per season basis or something like that. So that's that will be another interesting wrinkle that, you know, you may have to circle back like you're saying on on uh, on some of these players that, you know, just didn't have the magic 500, 3000 or or 300. Um you know, Homer's, uh, Homer's hits or, or wins, um, new metrics may have to force people to look at uh, these guys differently. Uh, interesting. I, I, I learned a lot from uh, Jim Cott did a great interview on Mad Dog Russo on December 7th. So if you're uh, a serious XM subscriber, go back and catch that one on demand. It was so good. Um, he talked about how he came up short in wins. He had t- uh, 283, but he was also in an era where saves presented themselves in a very different manner. And he had 18 saves. So from that metric, he kind of, you know, he felt like he was kind of at the 300 wins. He said he wasn't obsessed at all with 300 wins. He was just, uh, and he told great stories about how Whitey Herzog came to him uh, toward the end of his career and said, look, you know, I want you to be my lefty against lefty guy. And he had, a, a, a you know, one of his most fun seasons of his career was uh, 82, the Sud series, and, and he gets the ring with the Cardinals. Um, he also went totally off the rails. Uh, dog is talking to him about Ray Scott, the announcer. And he's like, oh yeah, I was good friends with Ray Scott. And, you know, I used to go in the off season, uh, I'd be at Lambeau field and, you know, I was on the sidelines and, you know, I helped put jackets on guys from the other team, like Gail Sayers. I'm like, what? Like Jim <laughs> Like, yeah, I was at the ice bowl. Jim Cott was at the ice bowl. What? How? Th- that's crazy. I was like, how is this even possible? Jim Cott was at the ice bowl. I think he was, I, I, I didn't exactly get it in. Like I was listening pretty intently. So I wasn't sure if he was like working the sidelines at the ice bowl, putting coats on people like the players. Uh, yeah. Or if he was just in attendance for that game, but he said he went to like tons of Packers games back then. And um, that was a really, really great interview. And Cot, look, look Cot's, Cot's great. He's been a great announcer for a long time as well. And, um, you know, for him, I like he, he talked about his dad. His dad was a huge Lefty Grove fan. And he's got a picture of his, of his dad in 1947 at Cooperstown at Lefty Grove's hall of fame induction. They drove out from Michigan. Um, and uh, it was really, it was just, it was, it was so cool. I learned so much about, uh, you know, Jim Cott, a guy who we did fortunately get to see play at, at the end of his career. And I've heard him, you know, he's a guy that's forgotten more about baseball than, you know, most people will ever know in their lives. And of course, one of his comments that I shared uh, on a Twitter thread earlier on this uh, December 8th uh, afternoon was that uh, Kitty Cott said, when dog asked him how many times in a game did you throw the ball as hard as you could? And he said, never, not once. He never threw a ball like as hard as he could throw it. And that led to some great debate, like, you know, she gone nation and some Ross Grimsley's getting involved on Twitter. You got to love it. So that was, that was pretty cool to just see some of the, uh, you know, some of the people like Greg Olson jumped in, you know, they're talking about running and what that does for pitchers. It was really good thread. So that, that confluence of, uh, of stuff was, uh, was a nice little moment 
that uh, that I had. And I know, dog, we were we were talking about that before, but you'll you'll enjoy catching it. That'll take you like an hour to read that thread. <laughs> yeah, I was I was catching bits and pieces of Greg's stuff. I, I saw that kind of popping through. I was uh, I was kind of buckling down at work uh, here today, but I did see some of that kind of pop up, and I love it when Greg uh, chimes in. I mean, he, Greg has great uh, perspectives. He's not on. He's not on. I don't think as much as some of the other guys, but uh, he's a he's obviously very very knowledgeable. And he's uh, he's very good on uh, on social media on uh, on putting that information out. Yeah, and and Ross Grimsley is like, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if you played baseball, but I pitched in the majors for 12 years, and I've been coaching people for 31 since then. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> it's a pretty good resume, you know. <laughs> like, I wasn't telling people, like, I didn't tell people anything. I just told them what Jim Cott said, <laughs> and then you know, and then the, you know, I dropped the match. I'm my, my sources. <laughs> I dropped the match and I and I walked away. Um, all right, dog, Met manager. Uncle Paul and uh, and George Moore has chimed in in the comments that immediately <laughs> that they cannot have Buck Show Walter hired soon enough. Um, we will see what uh, what the, what Billy Epler and Steve Cohen decide to do in terms of bringing in a manager. They are interviewing candidates as well. They should. There's not. Um, it, it, like, listen, we were talking about how the Mets were kind of behind the eight ball here and that they might have missed out on signing Noah Syndergaard because they didn't have a GM in place. And, you know, they still don't have a, a manager in place, but they didn't have a GM in place at the time. He walked and then, you know, for double the price and three extra years, you got Matt Scherzer instead of Noah Syndergaard. <laughs> and you got uh, and you got Starling Marte and Mark Canna and um the other Eduardo guy. Escobar. Yeah, Eduardo Escobar. Escobar. Yeah. So, you know, you got all the the you know, you got three thirty threes and a thirty seven year old to uh to to get in there. And you know, maybe dog that becomes a little indicative. Maybe that tips the the hand a little bit of what kind of manager it will be. Do you bring in those kind of veteran players and then bring in an analytics kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, robot, so to speak, you know, a Dave Roberts type or an Aaron Boone type that's going to do what the GM says to do? Or do you go to a Buck Showalter who is not going to do what the GM says to do? He's going to do what Buck Showalter wants to do on, on an everyday basis, right? I, I feel yeah. like that probably tipped the hand a little bit as to what type of manager uh, and managerial profile, Billy Epler is going to be looking at, and he's going to be preaching to uh, to his owner that he wants to uh, make a move on. So I would say that, you know, if you put two and two together, uh, and the fact that I believe that Scherzer essentially publicly said that he wants Showalter <laughs> as a manager, which means like now, if you don't have Showalter as the manager, you just now you just exactly now you just off Mad Max. Yeah, first first question. <laughs> if you're yeah. not Joe Walter, um, yeah, I, I think it's a great uh, you know I think it's a great analysis. I mean, it's funny. I was I was kidding around before on how uh, you know like the Mets couldn't find anybody who possibly wanted to be the G general manager of the Mets, and how how low was us, and we couldn't get anybody in there. Also, like now you go for like the manager, which you know you argue has been pushed down in importance like, broadly across baseball. Um, and also now it's like oh the A team, it's like oh yeah we'll get any, any pretty much anybody you want that uh, that you'd have consideration. They're all like yeah sure I'll come uh, I'll come interview for uh, for manager for the Mets. Um, you know is that going out and signing the guys and all of a sudden everything turned on a dime or was the GM stuff completely overblown? Who knows right? Um, I do think um, you know the Mets are clearly shaping up for a go for it in the next two years. Right, I mean, the, the contracts say that. Everything else says that that you're you're pretty much going for it for two years, and then you're probably in a, a strip down for another couple of years and rebuild with the next crop that's coming up uh, through uh, through the miners. Um, and I think you know holding on to those guys and stuff sort of sets that back up. Um, ideally, you can do that somewhat seamlessly. We'll see on that. Right, if in two years you know do you have a real hard down year, or are you able to kind of keep that sustained success? that Cohen uh, has been preaching. Um, we'll see, we'll wait to see on that one. Um, honestly, almost any of the guys they were describing, 
I think they're all solid candidates. I mean, they all have different uh, different advantages and disadvantages. I think it really comes down to, uh, you know, who fits best within the organization. Um, and I think, you know, if you're going to go for it, I mean, you know, look, we talked before on like, you know, like, like Louis Rojas, right? Louis, uh, kid around and said he's got like the war of zero, right? Like he's, he's, he's perfectly fine. He's not going to, he's not going to hurt you. He, you know, he may, may help out a little bit and like you know, the players will like him or whatnot, but like, it's not going to zip you up one way or the other. Um, if you're going for it, it kind of feels like you want to go for a, a more senior veteran guy who's when you're, you know, when you have that tough decision in the playoffs, who's the guy you want making that call? And, you know, there's one clear guy on there who, who sort of sets that sets that up. And, oh, by the way, can I tweak them a little bit that the Yankees held on to Boone and then Mets go out and sign Buck Showalter? And would that please Montan fan Steve Cohen? Yeah, there might be a little bit of that, right? It's not not quite as the way as it used to be anymore, but yeah, we might we might uh, tweak the tail a little bit on that. One. And uh, could Buck finally get his uh, his his series with the uh, with the Metsies that uh, they weren't able to do with the Yankees? Um, doesn't make up for Gooden and Cone and Strawberry and all that, but <laughs> it's still uh, you know there's probably a little bit of that deep down there. Um, so yeah, I think he's clearly the choice. But I think that the nice thing is just about everybody on there. I could support as as being the Met manager. Um, I do think there's a one and there's a rest of the list, but uh, I'm actually pretty happy with pretty much everyone on the list. What about Beltran? Would you seriously consider him mm-hmm. at this point? I know there's a lot of push for him. Um, you know, the people who think he's good think he's great and yeah. really want him. And then there's the others who are like, well, they just want to stay away from him because you kind of been there, done that once, and why go back? But, but. The Red Sox kind of paved the way for that, right? Yep. They had Alex Cora. He got suspended. They let him go, and then he came back a year later. A.J. Hinch was let go from the Astros. He served his one-year suspension, went to the Tigers, and all of a sudden, you know, the Tigers kind of came out of nowhere, and they look like they're headed in the right direction. So Beltran's been, you know, he's been so – so named by many as a can't miss type managerial candidate. What about Beltran? I am going to be all in on my, I want all my toys <laughs> that we had on before. Uh, how about Beltran as a bench coach to learn from Buck, let Buck do it for a couple of years, get his title and then, uh, and then turn it over to a guy like a Beltran who I do, who I do actually think would be a great manager for the Mets. And I think he, I think he got, um, he took too much of the arrows for the whole situation in Houston. Um, you know, he's a player, right? And he was getting bashed and had, had more consequences than the Astros organization, uh, which was ridiculous. Um, as far as ridiculous, as uh, as I would say. So um, um, I think that would make a ton of sense, frankly, um, uh, from both Beltran's perspective and for the organization uh perspective as well uh steve cohen did say he doesn't want anyone learning on his dime right so uh he wants to get a proven guy in there which again you know maybe argues for a, a, a show alter but uh getting in beltron who's you know one of the best you know probably is the best um position player that the mess have ever had um you know that's uh that's a pretty strong sign and i think that's you know he's 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 paid his dues I think I'm there. And if he went in and got to, you know, learn sort of way up, um, he's got a brilliant mind. He'd be, I think he'd be a phenomenal bench coach. Uh, I think he's going to be a good manager someday. So uh, if that's, if he'd be amenable to something like that, I think, uh, I think it's a great way to do it. And I think, LA, I think New York is a, a great place for him to have that opportunity. All right. So if you're not watching, uh, the video or the live stream, you got to check it out because you just got to see dog with the, with the doghouse background, <laughs> a, a nice added twist, and now he's brought the snowball in, so you could see, so he's, you could see the mic too. But uh, it's a good trade-off, I think. So go check that out. But we're gonna switch gears here for a second, and we will switch over our segment to our closing piece, Die Hard Dads. <laughs> you know, one thing that uh, is important for a dad 
dog is to drive around in a clean vehicle if you'd like to be seen. And the way to do that, especially around northern New Jersey in uh, Bergen or Passaic counties, is to go and stop at Big Ed's Car Wash in Fairlawn. I know Georgia Morez probably isn't too far away, and he could take up trip up to see Big Ed. And I recommend that he do so and everybody else do so if you're in the area. Big Ed's Car Wash, Fairlawn, New Jersey, a great supporter of Diamond Diehards, as is fmsgraphics.com, where you can get all your printing and promotional needs, especially as we head into this holiday season. There are things you like to send out the old school way and printing and promotional needs are in full effect. Still the way to do that. FMSgraphics.com. FMSgraphics.com, a family owned, family run business for the last 50 years. Dog has the wonderful new background picture, but sometimes that might not be appropriate for the zoom calls during the workday and he might need a nice piece of art behind him for his home his office or in this case his home office and for that he might well go to sportsmaps.com sports maps m-a-p-z sports m-a-p-z dot com pick up a fine piece of art for the sports fanatic in your life or for yourself treat yourself for the man cave or the she shed sportsmaps.com s p o r t s m a p z dot com dog die hard dads i uh i was at the uh so for those of you who who don't know uh if you're on youtube you could do uh check youtube and uh you could search joe rizzo rockets and you could see where i do the play by play for new jersey rockets girls hockey youth hockey uh, they have a 16U team and a 19U team. I'm pretty much there for all the 19U games, and I do the 16U games when I can. And on Tuesday night, I was at practice, and I was talking to my friend Andy, who uh, I believe is a listener of the show. Although he's not a huge, not the hugest baseball fan, he's what I call a good baseball fan. He go, They go on a trip here and there, they go take in a game They They happen to be rolling through Pittsburgh. They plan it out to, to see a game there. Um, and it's very interesting because as Andy explained to me, he said, well, you could tell what kind of fan I am because I used to be a Yankee fan. And then he's like, remember back like 15 or something years ago when the Yankees were having that dispute with cable vision and the games weren't on. I'm like, yes, I do remember that. I think it was Comcast, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, Cablevision. Cablevision. Yep. Most people had Cablevision. They were the chief provider at that time, and Yankee games were literally like not on for a season. And he said, "Well, I was a Yankee fan, and because the Yankees weren't on, I was like, eh, the hell with it. I'll, I'll just become a Met fan." And so he became a Met fan. Well, his daughter, who, who's a wonderful player, by the way, her name is Hope. Uh, Hope is. She, now she's a big Met fan. So he said hopes, you know, the driving baseball force in the family. She's a big Met fan. And then he dropped this dime on me. He goes, in fact, she wears number 48 on her hockey jersey because she's such a big Jacob deGrom fan. Nice. I'm like, love it. Thank you, Andy, for the Die Hard Dad segment. <laughs> oh, baby. You just gave it to me. You didn't even know it, but you gave it to me. There you go. So. And uh, yeah, if you get to watch those Rockets games, you'll see. I get to I get to call Hope's name a lot. She's a wonderful, wonderful player. Um, and uh, she actually she and and uh, Louisa did get a chance to play together a uh, bunch toward the end of last season, uh, and made some good moments together. And now they're on you know they're on different teams at at the moment. Same organization. It's really great. It's a great experience there with the New Jersey Rockets as. You know, it doesn't matter which team the girls are on. There's a lot of interaction between uh, those two teams, and they even have a developmental program. And uh, it's it's really been unique. You know, we don't we don't see that very often. There's usually a lot of drama and politics and stuff, believe it or not, in girls hockey. And you know, there's there's a tiny bit of it here, but it's in it's in small pockets and over you know the overarching umbrella 
uh, says, you know, most of the girls there are, are having a very good experience. So there's my diehard dads. And now let's see, dog, have I teed it up for you properly? Uh, sure. Yeah. So mine uh, will be uh, the uh, the intern from uh, Die Hard. Uh, Diamond Diehards coming back. Uh, Katie just came back uh, from uh, from Amsterdam, so she was out for ninety days out there. So our, our TikTok took a little bit of a hit. We uh, we we, uh, we, we, uh, we lost the rights <laughs> to her sitting out there, but uh, yes, managed to uh, managed to come home. So uh, much to the relief of my uh, my credit card, which was uh, was just getting hit hard, uh, harder than uh, I don't know some hanging hanging curveballs out there. <laughs> But uh, we made it home. <laughs> and that's and that's good. Uh, brought a little gifts for everyone. So I got. I was actually I was going to put it on. I didn't get a chance to do it. She got me a natty little hat from uh, from Amsterdam. So I'll I'll put that on for a, a future episode. But uh, yes, it's good. To, good to have her back. Got to see. She got to see the diamond dog, who was very happy to have someone else back from the pack. So she's in full swing. And then uh, yeah, and hopefully Molly will be back uh, at some point uh, this weekend or or next week. From, uh, from college, and uh, we'll be back at uh, full strength at uh, in uh, the Healy House. More importantly, we got to get uh, another TikTok on the board. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, that, now that she's back. Okay, so we covered it all. Lockout issues, Hall of Fame, Mets manager situation, and uh, we sprinkled a, a, a little bit more even in there, and that's going to do it for Another wonderful episode on a on a Wednesday, December eighth. Uh, happy name day to Debbie Rizzo. Uh, dog, I had to get that in there. You know, it's the feast of the Fair Immaculate nice. Conception. You know, born on onomastico to uh, to Debbie Rizzo. And again, if you want to follow us, we'd appreciate that. Check out our Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash Diamond Diehards. At Diamond Diehards everywhere on social media. Go click it now. Go find it now. Follow us on Twitter. Also follow the dog on Twitter at Jeff Healy 8. That's the number 8. And uh, join us on LinkedIn as well. We have a page there, uh, Diamond Diehards. It's Diamond Diehards everywhere. TikTok. You know, go check out the TikToks that we have up there. Even Uncle Paul's been on there. So... Uncle Paul, who's uh, our biggest supporter since day one, has a has a wonderful TikTok that's uh, that's out there from the summertime. If you are listening, we want you to hit those subscribe or follow buttons and the alert buttons. And if you're on YouTube, subscribe and alerts as well. And if you'd love to write us a review, uh, we'd hope that it's a good one, and we'd appreciate it if you do and throw some stars up there. Help your boys out as we do this and we continue to do it now uh, solidly into year two and pushing into Cal. Well, year three would technically be, uh, I don't know, maybe the third year since we started, but it's once the year switches, that'll be the third year in which we've done shows. So we're, we're, we're growing, we're growing, we're getting, we're getting old. Uh, we're not just getting better. <laughs> That's going to do it for this show hopefully some more news as we move forward and i think we're we're uh, our off-season plan here has been adjusted to start to include more guests working on that literally as we speak although uh, i didn't see another text come back yet that i'm waiting for but that'll be hopefully an exciting one as uh, we give you more guests we had missy coombs on recently and uh, we'll bring some more guests to you as well as we go forward that will wrap it up for the dog, Jeff Healy. This is Joe Rizzo. Diamond Diehards is out.